It's Saturday morning cartoons. And here's a cartoon image of yours truly. And you'll notice that there are kind of chakra landmarks marked out there on the on the vertical vertical line there. And you you see Thelemic holy words associated with it. There's Iwas there at the Anjna Chakra. And you see arrows pointing to the to the to the lips and the throat. Then there you got Therian and you got uh, arrows kind of pointing toward the the heart and the solar plexus and then you've got the navel and the muladhara chakra there with arrows going to the word babylon and you've got nuit there now this is actually a color image i've uh, posted it uh, there but uh, nuit there is around that circle there that's around the head and uh, Hadith is uh, there around the the chakra, the root chakra, the Muladhara chakra, and uh, you got Rahur Kuwait there, right by the the heart and kind of solar plexus uh, uh, area there, and then you've got these horizontal arrows. Now the top arrow is uh, uh, going from left to right. But the, and that would be like the path of uh, Daleth on the Tree of Life, if we were going to uh, put that on a Tree of Life. And the middle arrow there is going from right to left, uh, just right over across the chest area there, the sternum area. And then lower there, going again from uh, uh, left to right, is that lower arrow. And... Uh, on a tree of life, it would look something like that. Why am I showing you this? Well, first of all, it's Saturday morning cartoons. And here I am. I'm going to be animated for you today. We're talking about Lieber 5 Vel Reguli. Okay. Now, this is included in uh, Magic of Alistair Crowley, Handbook of the Rituals of Thelema. And so is the uh, introductory material and comments uh, that precede it that I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. So this is Thelemic Pentagram Ritual Number 2. It's not named number two. It's the second one. The first one we talked about was uh, the Star Ruby yesterday's. Liber 5 Vel Reguli. Now we come to the Thelemic pentagram ritual about which there is considerable disagreement and controversy. Well, not really. Not for anyone that does a little homework, okay? Uh, unthreateningly described as, quote, an incantation proper to invoke the energies of the Aeon of Horus, adopted for daily use of the magician of whatever grade. That's you. Its ambiguities and mysteries, nevertheless, continue to challenge and intrigue students. Crowley's published comments on Reguli are sparse, so I've been fortunate to have been allowed access to notes in several unpublished versions of the ritual, which have been helpful in writing this chapter. Crowley introduces Reguli as, quote, the ritual of the mark of the beast, unquote, which to many people especially those who think they understand the book of the Revelation of John, has a decidedly sinister ring to it. 
But as is usually the case with the nomenclature of Thelemic magic, the expression that evokes fear and loathing in the hearts of the profane is revealed to the wise to be a profound and spiritually wholesome arcanum. To the Kabbalists, the mark of the beast, uh, from uh, Revelation uh, 13, 16, uh, is the New Testament development of the Mark of Cain, which is the Old Testament, Genesis 4.15, which, contrary to popular religious interpretation, is not the brand of a cursed sinner, but instead represents the radiant seal of illumination on the forehead of the initiate. Graphically, the Mark of the Beast is represented in its most simple form as the sun and moon united. And among other things is the symbol of Babylon and the beast conjoined and the great work accomplished. Let's see, do it. Yeah, that's the simplest mark of the beast right there. Sun and moon conjoined. Now, I suppose you could join them at, uh, at a different... Uh, uh, orientation, but you also sometimes see it like this with, well, that's not a very good one, but uh, with uh, two other circles uh, that the moon nestles in and the sun nestling in the moon, which uh, uh, doesn't take too much of a of an imagination to see sort of a, a, a bird's eye view of uh, uh, an erect uh, phallus with testicles and stuff there. Uh, but that's only for people that, uh, that uh, aren't embarrassed about things like that. Otherwise, people don't understand it. Okay, therefore, as, quote, an incantation proper to invoke the energies of the Aeon of Horus, the ritual of the Mark of the Beast, if properly executed, serves to rewire the psychic body of the magician to accommodate these higher spiritual energies. In fact, the overt employment of the various chakras makes reguli, Libra 5, as much a yogic exercise as a ritual of ceremonial magic. While roughly adhering to the basic format of the pentagram rituals and the star ruby, there are some fundamental and drastic differences that distinguish Libra 5 vel reguli. Some of these are obvious. Others, I feel, need to be addressed. Now, the first gesture. Now, keep in mind that all ceremonial rituals, or most of them, uh, classic ones, are modular in nature. Like there's, there's part one, like the beginning of a pentagram ritual, greater or lesser, starts off with a Kabbalistic cross. Uh, whereby we, we, we affirm uh, what kind of microcosm we are to what kind of a macrocosm we're reflecting. So when we do a Kabbalistic cross, we are simply stating, I am functioning as a, as a reflection, as a physical reflection of the dynamics of the tree of life. Ata, I was, Malka, to your, we, uh, you're saying to the universe, I am a tree of life, and here are my landmarks, okay? That begins the lesser ritual, the greater ritual, 
and in and in, in a, a version of it begins the stars uh, uh, Ruby and a version of that begins this too. Now you can use that Kabbalistic cross on any other ritual that, that you would create yourself perhaps. It's modular. You plug that in. If that's who you are going to uh, uh, be functioning as, is that if that is the microcosmic uh, uh, or a statement an identity with the microcosmic reflection of the, the macrocosm, use it. Fashion your own ritual. Start it off by, by that, if that's who you're going to uh, assume that you're functioning as. There's a marvelous uh, temple opening f for uh, uh, Liber Pyramidos, or Liber Troa, which was an earlier version of uh, Pyramidos, where, whereby you uh, uh, literally build the space that you're in, the pyramid that you're in, and the office, there's three officers that you, that, oh, it, it's gorgeous. And you can use that temple opening for, for any uh, uh, ceremony that you would devise or, or fabricate yourself. But I digress. The first gesture for uh, the Thelemic Pentagram Ritual number two, star or Libra five, the Kabbalistic cross opening found in the previous rituals affirms the three columns of the Tree of Life. The middle pillar, Ata Malkuth, the pillar of severity, Geburah, and the pillar of mercy, Gedula. In Reguli, this has been replaced by the vertical component of the enchantment, which affirms the middle pillar, and three horizontal components of the enchantment, which affirms the three horizontal paths on the tree of life. And when you're through doing that, you create the classic hierophantic cross that you see in all sorts of Christian iconography, especially those of uh, bishops and things like that. The incorporation of the horizontal paths is perhaps the most notable in innovation of Reguli and sets it apart fundamentally from all other rituals of the pentagram. This is especially significant in the light of the fact that Crowley maintained that the Aeon of Horus activated the path of Tet. That's the middle one there, the one that goes from four to five. The path of Tet, which is the, the in the tarot card, the strength card, in the Thoth deck in Tarot Ceremonial Magic, it is the Lust card. It's the lion, okay? The roaring lion. Crowley considered that the Aeon of Horus, in a way, uh, was activated or activated uh, uh, the path of Tet on some cosmic universal uh, tree of life. Uh, well, I should just let Duquette read. This is especially significant in the fact that Crowley maintained that the Aeon of Horus activated the path of Teth, the horizontal path between the fifth Sephira, Gebura, and the fourth Sephira, Chesed, on, on the universal tree of life. Okay. Now, I've got illustrations there. What we're going to be talking about. There's those three horizontal paths. Those are the horizontal uh, components of the enchantment. And here's the words that we're going to be using 
when we uh, uh, do this first gesture. The second gesture. Like the lesser and greater rituals of the pentagram, the pentagrams of reguli are drawn in the air. But unlike any of the previous ceremonies, the pentagrams employed in reguli are described as a verse. Now, there's a very simple, straightforward explanation uh, based on Crowley's notes that had to really be dug out what he means by a verse. But because a verse is such a curious word and people are so freaked out about the thought of drawing a pentagram upside down because of all sorts of warnings that the that uh, was part of the Golden Dawn tradition, that I went to considerable lengths to, uh, to uh, uh, talk about averseness. And, uh, and I'm going to share that with you today because it's, it, it's kind of important for us to, to uh, put our minds at rest about uh, about the averseness of all of this. Okay. Crowley was a master of the English language, and averse is a very curious word for him to use. What is an averse pentagram? Is it upside down? If so, well, simple answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> Go get a cup of coffee. Simple answer is yes. Okay. If so, if it's just simply upside down, wouldn't inverted be a much more accurate word? Is it upright with the elemental positions reversed? Unfortunately, publish, uh, Crowley published no precise definition. In 1978, I asked Israel regarding what he thought Crowley meant. To my disappointment, he told me that he didn't know for certain, but he believed that Crowley may simply wish to shock and outrage the members of the Golden Dawn, whose fear of the inverted pentagram bordered on phobia. That's his words. Regardi recommended that I use the traditional upright pentagrams, which is not a particularly uh, unreasonable thing to do, especially when you're uh, uh, learning the ritual and memorizing the ritual and memorizing uh, things to get yourself uh, into the habit of doing stuff by second nature. Even before you understand what you're doing, you just sort of like a, an actor that, that memorizes the script first so that uh, when the, the inspiration, when, when his character indwells uh, uh, him, uh, the, the words are second nature. But uh, I don't think upright pentagrams are what Crowley really intended for us ultimately to use. Uh, other Crowley experts have been uh, even less helpful on the subject, suggesting everything from reversed upright pentagrams to upside down pentagrams formulated in the mind and hurled forth as in the star ruby. Now, I've got an illustration here. Now, these are two ways of looking at uh, averseness. Averseness simply means turned away like a like a, a leaf two sides of a leaf and that could be turned away that way or that way both of these are are technically a verse there's a verse on the vertical axis a verse on the horizontal axis axis 
The dictionary defines a verse as turned away or backwards. In botany, it refers to leaves which are turned away from the axis on a main stem as, as opposed to adverse, uh, in which the leaves uh, turn toward the axis. By this definition, we might conclude that two pentagrams, one upright and one inverted, joined horizontally at the axis at their bases, could both be considered a verse to each other. We could also include, though with less conviction, that two upright pentagrams mirroring each other from left to right is also a verse. Following the Kabbalistic axiom of polarities, in other words, we are negative to the plane below us and positive to the plane, well, we're just the opposite above and below, okay? The two pentagrams with the horizontal axis could be projected on a tree of life like this. Granted, this arrangement leaves poor Malkuth dangling like a dingleberry. But that's, that's not a position without Kabbalistic precedence. But everything else fits quite nicely uh, using the path of Tet as the baseline. All, of, all three horizontal paths so important to Liber Reguli are represented. See? All three are represented by that. Let's see. Also note that, that two tetrahedrons are formed by the arrangement. Uh, what that means might just be a graphic uh, uh, revelation. Another method is to project all four A-verse pentagrams upon the tree, as shown in figure 7. Okay. Um, There's figure seven. And if you put them all together, they would look like that. Another method is to project all four A-verse pentagrams upon the tree as shown in figure seven above. Here we see that the path of Teth is unique among the three horizontal paths. Like a looking glass, it is the point of reflection, the pivotal access to all four A-verse pentagrams. Once the four are superimposed upon a tree, we discover that they form a double version of Crowley's universal hexagram. You got to sort of know what the universal hexagram looks like and then say, oh, there it is. Okay. Or the hexagram of the beast, otherwise known, uh, which is traced in line uh, 20 of the second gesture of Reguli. Okay. That's coming up. Don't worry. The student wishing to pursue this line of speculation further can construct pentagrams based on the universe card. The five of discs from the Crowley Thoth Tarot, uh, the elemental format of those used in the greater ritual of the pentagram, or by projecting the pentagrams on the tree of life according to the elemental rulership of the Sephiroth. That's kind of pretty technical stuff. But I'm, I'm just bringing it up. Viewed in relation to other Thelemic rituals, especially the star, sapphire, there are even subtler, more complex considerations to be weighed, including the concept of employing the NOx formula to access an averse or reversed tree of life. 
Speculation on this matter could continue indefinitely, and I'm not sure that wasn't Crowley's intention. Over the last 20 years, well, in this case, almost 30 years, uh, my understanding and application of Thelemic rituals has grown. My opinion on the subject has changed at least a dozen times. Confusion over this point, however, did not prevent me from learning the ritual and working with it on a daily basis. It's only by working the rituals that any significant degree of understanding can develop. If you wait until you're positive you understand all aspects of the ceremony before beginning to work, you'll never begin to work. All conjecture aside, the whole question of the A-verse pentagram seems to finally have been put to rest by a manuscript bearing Crowley's handwritten notes and drawings recently found at the George Arendt's Research Library at Syracuse University. This typescript, whose provenance has been tentatively attributed to 1928, includes the entire text of uh, Liber V Vel Reguli, complete with drawings of the various pentagrams and symbols. It reveals without ambiguity that the A-verse pentagram, or at least the one as he's describing in this ritual, is simply the standard pentagram turned upside down. Now, I know that sounds very simple, but see where the elements now are positioned. So you turn the pentagram upside down, but if you keep the, if you also turn the English upside down, you see that now, see where the direction of fire, earth, air, and water, and spirit down below. Okay. The elements remain in their same positions and directions for invoking and banishing are exactly as they would be if you drew a standard upright pentagram on a piece of paper then simply turned the paper upside down. Now we know for certain what averse pentagrams are, but why do we use them? A clue to our answer might be found in Reguli's unique positioning of the four fixed signs of the zodiac in the circle that we're going to be using. Traditionally, the zodiac is thought of as a belt of 12 constellations or signs through which the sun passes from the Earth's point of view in a counter clockwise yearly journey. We could make a traditional magical circle of the zodiacal belt by placing Taurus in the east, Leo in the north, Scorpio in the west, Aquarius in the south. So in other words, we just, we just make our circle, put the zodiac like that. That would be our, we see how Aries in the, or, or Taurus in the east there, and then going around counterclockwise. That's, uh, that's, a, that's an upright circle. That's what we're used to doing. See the magician standing there? See his head? That's the back of his head, and he's, and, uh, he's looking east at Taurus. So west would be Scorpio. Okay. As we see in Reguli, or as we see described in Reguli, this is not quite the case. Taurus is still in the east, and Scorpio is still in the west. But the positions of Leo 
and Aquarius are reversed. So in other words, we're still talking about Taurus in the east, Scorpio in the west, but we've got Leo over here and we've got Aquarius over here. In other words, for this ritual, the signs of the zodiac are now running clock. Has Crowley turned the belt of the Zodiac upside down? No, he's turned the Magician upside down. And with it goes his stars. As I've mentioned earlier, in Thelemic rituals of the pentagram, the Magician no longer thinks of himself or herself as standing upon the surface of the earth, geocentric, but rather identifies with the sun, heliocentric. From the sun's point of view, there is no up or down. In order to help liberate the magician from the old aeon illusion of restricted orientation, Crowley now positions us upside down in the center of the zodiacal belt. In this position, the zodiac now appears to run count, uh, clockwise, and from the point of view of mac microcosmic orientation, the pentagrams we would draw from this position are naturally averse. If it were possible for you to actually perform Libra 5 Vel Reguli while standing on your head, then from your upside down point of view, the zodiac would run counterclockwise and the pentagrams would be upright. Perhaps for some, the averse pentagrams will continue to be a frightful symbol of the triumph of matter over spirit as the aspirants of the Golden Dawn were warned. In Reguli, however, it's not the case of matter triumphing over spirit. Rather, it's a case of spirit descending into matter. I've incorporated Crowley's notes and drawings from the above-mentioned manuscript in the text of Lever Reguli that follows in this book. I've also included as footnotes his comments from another manuscript. My own comments as editor are identified as such. And then we get into the, the ritual itself, which will be Sunday school. And if you would like to study this a little bit uh, 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 deeper and at your leisure, please avail yourself of one of my one of my favorite efforts, the magic of Aleister Crowley, Handbook of the Rituals of Thelema, published by the good folks at Wiser Books. This uh, image I've posted on my. Uh, uh, Facebook page once again. You can turn to uh, to this, especially tomorrow, when we uh, when we talk about the ritual proper. So that's it for Saturday morning cartoons. I hope you have a great weekend. Continue to be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Happy birthday, my good friend, great Thelemite, great magician great human being, Rodney Orpheus. It's his birthday. Uh, do something nice for Rodney today. Buy some of Rodney's books. They're absolutely excellent. A great Thelemite. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.